Okay, thank you for um, inviting me to speak at St Edmund's first climate change and eco church event. Um, I, I think it's a real privilege to speak at this event um, where we can, you know, style and share our concern uh, for the climate issue. Uh, whatever happens in the world in reference to climate change, people are either angry, uh, disappointed, indifferent, or in denial. Some, uh, like Greta Thunberg, are positively angry and completely in denial would be the Donald Trumps of the world. I myself am not an angry activist, but a disappointed one. Disappointed with my own actions, saddened by the lack of effort demonstrated by domestic and foreign governments, and the failure of my elders to regard the reality of climate change. Climate change is not a myth or a fairy tale, nor is it fiction, but fact and truth. It is undeniably the biggest step we face. We argue that the collective phrase global warming is deceptive. It doesn't necessarily sound menacing, threatening or ominous. In fact, to us Brits shivering on our chilly, lonesome island, it sounds rather appealing. I think most of us would cherish a few more blinks under the sun's beam and the weather a few degrees warmer. But it seems that the phrase global warming is misleading because it doesn't identify the actualities as our unique, precious and marvellous globe warms. In school, statistics was the component of maths which I enjoyed most, simply because the math was relatable, almost tangible, and could easily be identified in society. I would like to inform you of some alarming statistics surrounding global warming. 2010 to 2019 was the hottest decade in recorded history. Record-breaking temperatures have become the norm as the planet warms at an exponential rate. There were 99 tropical storms in 2019, and because of this, a true tragedy, which pains us all, is that 6.7 million people uh, were displaced by must with an continuing to every. Sadly, most of these people originate from lower economic countries. Therefore, little, if any aid is provided by external and internal governments. People are left homeless, penniless and starving, rarely punished by their own mistakes, but by the actions of those in privileged circumstances or those who plunder the earth of his resources causing climate change. In this year alone, we have witnessed on our TV screens the record-breaking heat waves uh, and devastating fires in Canada, North America, Australia and Greece. Also, torrential rain, landslides and flooding in Indonesia, India, Germany and London, to name a few. Even our own community has suffered a degree of flooding. Simultaneously, the climate crisis is both the most straightforward and complicated issue humanity has ever faced. Straightforward because we know and understand what we must do to limit the imminent and long-term uh, rep uh, uh, repercussions of our negligence. To achieve success, we must stop the emissions of greenhouse gases and raise awareness of countries and corporations with the greatest carbon footprint and challenge them to make a difference. Complicated and problematic because modern economic systems revolve around the profitable schemes of institutions who rely on burning tons of fossil fuels and thereby damaging our ecosystem in order to create uninterrupted economic growth. As humans, we are easily influenced. Often we are inspired by anti-climate propaganda Let's not kid ourselves. It was only a year ago that the leader of the free world actively advocated against climate change. To counteract this, we must closely observe scientific data to better understand the repercussions of climate change. But more importantly, take into account that as Christians, we are custodians, gatekeepers and stewards of God's marvelous 
bountiful creation of Earth. It is our duty to safe keep our planet. But personally, ask yourselves, have I taken the responsibility to fulfill God's commission? I would like to read you a short section of the poem Webcam the World, written by Heather McHugh. The modern poem is a warning to everyone. Get all of it, set up the shots at every angle, run them online 24 seven. Get beautiful stuff like scenery and greenery and style and get the ugliness like cruelty and quackery and room. There's nothing unastonishing but get that too. We have to save it all now that we can and while. Do close-ups with electron microscopes and vaster pans with planet cams. It may be getting close to our last chance. Will we in 50, 60, 70 years be only left with videos and photos of our extraordinary home? Will the seven wonders be destroyed by natural disasters? What will be left of our astonishing reefs? Is the poet correct? Are we getting close? Is it our last chance? I appeal to your humanity and the possible future of your children and grandchildren. Often people are concerned about their legacy. What will I leave behind? What is my legacy? We should all take into account the legacy we will leave behind. Have we been good custodians? Have we educated our children, schoolmates, teachers, parents, colleagues and global women? Have we challenged councils, politicians, corporations, world leaders? The beautiful thing about the climate issue is that it's not denominational or restricted by borders, religion and ethnicity. It affects us all. Our intellect and money is being invested in a collective future which should benefit everyone. As global citizens, we must unite in the single, selfless goal to create a future worth living in. Let your legacy be left in the security and well-being of our planet. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction. And I'm delighted to be here this evening. Um, and that was a wonderful introduction because, yes, I started in the role of climate change champion in April that coincided with um, the climate emergency of the church in Wales. And we're now on this task, our path to get to net zero by 2030. Now I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me for two seconds um, to do that. There we go. Great. Hmm. Climate change 2021. Yes, we've declared a climate emergency. Yes, we're going to get to net zero. Yes. Fantastic. But what else? Why else is this year important for us? Now, my role covers all of Wales. Um, so working with all the dioceses, all the all the different churches um, individually working towards a net zero but also with other agencies and others who are going to assist us, other partners. So, but we need to work together. We need to work together because climate change this year is critical. The church has declared a climate emergency, but the scientists have been shouting about climate change and the urgency to the situation for many, many years. And I'm also going to um, share with you a little bit of my experiences in the Pacific just to put a context to the figures and some of the urgency that we hear. But first, this report that came out a couple of weeks ago by the IPCC, it's an overview, it's a review. And I won't go into any detail other than to point out how over time, the scientists have been becoming more urgent. 
when they first had a report in 1990, it was, well, we're not quite sure. Then it was, there was a, there's a link. We're probably, probably engaged somehow. Then it seems we're likely, then very likely, extremely likely. And now this report of a couple of weeks ago says it's unequivocal. Human activity is influencing the climate and has influenced the climate. And this is the important thing. Climate change is already impacting elsewhere in the world. And you could have had someone else this evening talking about another part of the world, maybe a different continent. The Pacific doesn't have a continent. It's sort of, if you look at the map there, it's wrapped over the edges, isn't it? It's lost. So I'll take you there. Now in the Pacific, we've got very low lying islands, atolls that are made entirely out of coral. And this example here is from the Cataract Islands, almost near, they're in Papua New Guinea, but they're almost near um, Solomon Islands. 3,000 people live on these islands and they're going to have to move. But this photo shows a person on the shoreline, but there's a coconut tree stump in the water. And look at the distance between that person and the coconut tree stump. That is how much land has been lost. A considerable amount, over half the land area. Now, when you go there and talk to the communities, they show you and tell you the urgency to this. They say there is absolutely nowhere to go and escape from the rising seas. If there's a storm, literally the children and the young person in the background of that photo is put on the shoulders of someone and they go into the middle of the island to escape. And that's all they can do is actually pray. And so this is a concern. What can they actually do? And Rafina is relating the stories. But everywhere throughout the Pacific, people are trying to defend themselves from the rising seas. And there's constant seawall re uh, repairing going on. <laughs> But well, that's great. This is Kiribati, uh, an, an island nation in the middle of the Pacific, quite literally in the middle of the Pacific. 30 islands, 100,000 people. Basically, you can't protect everything. The coastlines, it's impossible. Now, we tend to think of Coraline Islands with beautiful sea and sand. Well, in fact, it's not always the case. This is from Tuvalu. Tuvalu, uh, the main atoll in Funafuti, that is the sea coming in from the lagoon side. It's so rough, it's going over the waterway, the actual road. And that young girl is actually running across. But in the background, that modern building, that's the government. That's how close it is to the sea. There's only 11,000 people living in Tuvalu. This is the airport. It's underwater. And that's not from, it may be partly rainwater, but it's not. It's coming from water that's welling up from underground. So it can't be operational for part of the year. Now, atolls, flat islands, great. So you understand what the urgency is. But I can take you to Fiji, and I was based in Fiji most of the time. And here, People live around the coast. But the problem is, look, if you look here in this, this home, someone's home, that line across the doorway is the seawall. And you can see how ineffective that is. Kelepi's home is totally surrounded by sea. He's the district officer for Ono Island, a very high important influence and role. They're having to relocate. Another island in Fiji, Vanua Levu, another village, Vunidongaloa village. Here we can see the seawall. Can you see the seawall? It's actually the uh, lumpy stones that's a bit discolored, dark color. Well, they disappear, don't they? They've actually been dissolved. They've been broken away. And the village is exposed to the rising seas. And Lycia, 
This is her home and she's only known this home. She's only known this existence. She's got to move. Now, Wunidongaloa village has been fortunate because they actually had government funding and they relocated. They had land that's theirs and they relocated. This is their new home. And when I shown communities this photo, some others that are threatened by the sea, they go, that's fantastic. That's amazing, we want to move there. But in moving there, they've left everything behind. Everything's been turned upside down. They've no longer got that sea, that sea view, the sea breeze. They're two miles away from the coast. And the women who have to go fish every day, how do they do that? How do they carry their catch back? Everything's changed. And as I said, Vunidong Lower Village is fortunate because they actually relocated with the help of government. There are 45 other villages in Fiji that need to relocate now. And there isn't that money. And this is something we need to really push for. Now that's relocating because of rising seas, but unfortunately much of the Pacific is also vulnerable to other impacts, other disasters. And we've had recently the news over this um, last weekend, haven't we, of uh, Hurricane Ida in Louisiana. Well, the Pacific equally has horrendous cyclones, and they're called cyclones here. And in 2016, Cyclone Winston devastated Fiji. It was the worst ever recorded cyclone in the Southern Hemisphere, and it left trauma. People's lives are changing because of the climate. Climate change, it means something. It really means something to people else, elsewhere in the world. And this is what a, a Category 5 cyclone does to a community. I was in Fiji when this happened. And I can only imagine what that young man is feeling. The trauma that he is looking out on, that will never leave him. And the issue is, that was in 2016. Since then, there have been three more severe cyclones affect Fiji. People have to change. We have to change. People elsewhere, their lives have been turned upside down and they're forced to change. I just wonder what we as a church will do to change. Change as the church, change as the church communities. We really need to be in solidarity with people already affected. And that's something I'll, I'll leave you and challenge you with. What will we change? However small we change, other people have had their lives changed entirely, turned upside down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. Um, really lovely to, to be here with you. And really encouraging um, to be here, to, to be amongst a, a group of churches and Christians coming together to to think, you know, what can we do, you know, uh, and what can we do urgently to respond to the threat and the, the reality of, of climate change. So I was asked to, to speak to in, on, on two things. You know, one is um, why should we care uh, for creation? And, and, and the second one was how. So I'm not really going to major on the why, because um, uh, on Sunday, I'm sort of preaching a bit more Bit more to that but I'll, I'll mention it briefly but we'll think a bit more practical today about you know how we can care for creation at, as church community I've taken that angle rather than as, as individuals so I'll share my screen as well and um I've got some slides here and oh, right how do I start the slideshow there we go right okay now so, um, why should I care and, and, and how can I care? That's what we've done. Oh dear. There we go. So, um, why care? I mean, so sometimes I think anyone gathered here today probably has got an answer to that. But I think sometimes church communities wonder. I mean, they, they realise they've been asked to care 
by the world and they can see the reasons that we've been outlined with other communities and sometimes closer to home because of you know, flooding and storm events and so on. But they don't always, I don't think, recognise that they're being called to care by God, you know, not just by other people. And that that's really deeply embedded in our faith and our understanding um, of, of who God is and, and uh, what God, how God calls us to live. And, um, it's almost hidden in plain sight um, in the scriptures are these very striking calls to care for creation. And I've just picked out one. I mean, we could start in, in different places from St. Some, some Paul's letter to the Romans. And he talks about creation groaning in travail, you know, in great agony and trouble because of, you know, humanity's neglect, abuse and misdemeanors. And uh, creation uh, waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. You know, creation is waiting for us to play our part, to be God's children, to be those born again, you know, through our faith in, in Christ. <laughs> and uh, it's not just we who need um, that faith in Christ for our own sort of salvation. Creation is waiting for us to play, play our part, you know, uh, and our part, as you know from the book of Genesis, made in the image of God, is to be those who, who are called to, to, to act for God, to represent God uh, to each other and, and to the world. And that's why creation is waiting for us, you know, to play that part that we were created um, to take. And you know, mentioning Genesis as well, I mean, um, uh, Genesis 2, the, the sort of chapter that talks a bit more about human relations um, uh, and the creation of Adam and then Eve. And, um, and after Adam's created, he's put, in, put into the world is this pristine place of beauty that God has created and bequeathed um, into our care. And the, the phrase that's used is um, to till it and to keep it, you know. Um, that's kind of an agricultural interpretation almost, which is fitting, but you can equally translate the Hebrew as to serve and preserve it, you know, which kind of fits perhaps more closely with our understanding now as uh, having to care, care for creation. So uh, uh, right from the beginning, our role is, is there as, um, uh, you know, to serve and preserve and to till and to keep the earth, you know, and to delight in it as well as God does um, on the Sabbath day's rest. So it's just built into who we are. So part of the good news really of Christ is that Christ brings peace and reconciliation in all of these areas, you know, between us and the natural world, as well as between us and other people and us uh, and God. Uh, uh, and so actually caring for creation becomes a delight, you know, rather than an added burden, it's another opportunity to, to come in, into contact with God, you know, to, and to renew that relationship and I think that's something worth bearing in mind because often environmental uh, obligations are felt to be a real duty you know and, and something that we sort of begrudgingly have to do um, rather than something that we can really delight in as another avenue of our faith you know and outworking of our discipleship. I'll just so We'll explore perhaps some of those things a bit more on Sunday. But just thinking how, now how to care as church communities, because that's, I guess I'm involved with that as much as anything these days. And um, uh, I'm splitting into, just to keep it simple, was to talk about in two ways really to start with. And uh, one was energy and, uh, and the other was e eco-church. And energy is part of eco church, so as you probably know, and as you know, I'll, I'll explain uh, as well. But I think it's worth separating it out because um, if we're thinking about the climate emergency, um, energy generation, you know, is at the heart of it, isn't it? And uh, carbon emissions and so on. And it's and it's something that you should sort of tackle straight on, you know, without, <laughs> without beating around the bush in any way. And churches are so well placed when you do something about it, pretty much immediately. And um, just to you know, exhort you and, and exhort each other to, to swap to a green energy supplier, you know, straight away, and, and just don't don't delay. There's no reason to delay in in any way on that. Now, it may be that you are locked into a tariff that um, prevents that happening, but start the process now. You know, you can get things lined up, and there are lots of companies that provide 100% renewable energy. You know, so no carbon emissions or no fossil fuels. I should say, burnt. You know. 
in the generation of electricity. So, you know, it's mostly in, in the UK, it'll be wind uh, with a bit of solar, um, some, some minimal tidal, but that, that wind and solar really are in it, renewable energy in the UK. And uh, so, uh, you can, there's a few companies around the edge, Egotricity, Bulb, Good Energy, Octopus, uh, all 100% renewable energy companies. Now, some of the big utilities also provide renewable energy tariffs, and they often buy from these people to, to do that. I'm just a little bit wary sometimes of going with a, an established utility, say, you know, Scottish Power or whatever it might be, because there are some stories of them not quite, um, uh, I don't know, well, not quite get gathering all their energy from, from, from the sources that they say. So, I mean, I would just go to a reputable company or to be honest, the easiest way as a church would be to go to this parish buying. You see in the top left corner, that emblem. Some of you may already be involved with parish buying. It's a sort of um, nationwide scheme, Church of England, Church of Wales um, participate in it. And it buys um, items in bulk on behalf of churches so they get better prices and you can buy all sorts of things. But part of that is what they call the energy basket. And so parish buying collectively buy uh, large amounts of renewable energy and they source it from 100% renewable energy companies and they pass it on to, to us at, at a good rate. So you can be sure you're getting a, re a really good deal and it sort of takes the legwork out of hunting around, um, which can be a bit onerous because going to different companies and approaching them. So think about that, just go to parish buying, just log on to the website and, uh, uh, and go through and you can kind of get lined up. And, and if you are locked into a tariff, they'll kind of hold your application for you until such time as you're out and then you can proceed with it. So swap energy supplier, um, if, it, if you're not electricity in your church, you can have 100% renewable energy. If you're on gas um, or oil, it's a little bit harder, um, but you can buy a proportion um, of your energy from renewable, renewable sources. So just crack on with that. So eco church. I've been asked to speak a bit about eco church. I presume most of you, you know, got an idea really of what that's about. But I'll just give a, an overview. Uh, if, if some of you perhaps new to some of you. So it's this um, award scheme run by uh, a Russia uh, a Christian environmental charity, which is international, but it has a UK branch, and it's been really adopted by um, the Anglican Church in the UK as their vehicle for pursuing um, climate care, but also creation care uh, in, in a sort of wider way. A uh, very great, very helpful scheme, I think. And uh, so you, you participate, you bring your church community along with you and you modify and change your behavior in various ways um, to become more ecologically minded. And you can then gain a, a bronze, silver or gold award. Um, the bronze award isn't too difficult to get, which I think is helpful because probably you're gonna to have to do a little bit of work, but it's kind of attainable and it gets you on the path and it really gets you thinking about um, how and what to, to modify in your church life. And so that the scheme works by uh, asking you to fill in a questionnaire um, to, to get a to gauge where you are and what you're doing in church life and where, you're, where you might need to change. And it's split into five categories. There's worship and teaching, there's building, and there's some hardware, you know, there's land, um, there's community uh, uh, engagement, and, and there's lifestyle, those sort of five categories. And each one has a questionnaire um, for you to fill in. Now, you're probably aware as well that Eco Church is about individual church communities, but um, there's also a scheme called Eco Diocese. And if a sufficient number of Eco Churches in an area, um, you know, I think Julie's already mentioned, um, gain an award, then the diocese can claim to be an eco-diocese as well. And they can go through a bronze, silver or gold um, category too. So Landaf Diocese was the first to, to, to have a bronze status. And St. David's where I am is, is working uh, on that. And I'm hoping that we'll be there by next year. Uh, because, uh, um, but it takes, um, uh, you've got to have 10% of the churches registered say on Eco Church and 5% of already attained a bronze to get, you know, to get a, a bronze diocese award. And um, so it's, it's not huge, but it does still require commitment. So we're on the way. But anyway, that's sort of wider. I'm thinking more about individual churches here uh, today. 
And so just nuts and bolts, if you haven't get, got started, Eco Church into Google, pull up the website, and then see what this yellow arrow is. Just, just click on the, the login. It's on the first page, um, and you can just type in, it wants an email uh, and an address, and then it's kind of an online tool. But more than one person can engage, and I think I would encourage you to do that really as, as, a, as a team. It's much better if you know, it's a couple or three people take it on uh, within a church. And, it, and it's definitely much better if it's lay-led, really, rather than um, clergy-led. I mean, it's fine. If, great if your vicar wants to be part of it. But, you know, as you know, you know churches are there for the long haul, and vicars come and go, and it's much better if it's, there's ownership, really, um, from on the, the church itself. So begin to, to log in. And you, it's very simple. There's no kind of great obligation. There's no cost to it, and there's no obligation. Nobody's going to hound you with... Um, emails and stuff if you log in and, and make a start you know so don't feel fearful of that and you can just put your toe in and get a, a sense of where you are as a church by doing the questionnaires so here's an example of one of the, the questionnaires which um this is the worship and te teaching one the first one you'll, you'll come to if, if you log on and it asks questions like this um so question number one look, special sundays relating to caring for god's earth um creation time environment sunday etc are celebrated in our church and you get it's like multiple choice at least annually or less often or never so you just go through and you kind of you make a mark that in place that fits you and, and it, so question two the hymns and songs in our church enable us to celebrate god's creation you know at least quarterly or less often or never so you work your way through um uh, cl clicking the boxes and the same when it asks questions about your building and insulation and so on. So some, some things are easy to answer. Sometimes you have to click, um, go and find out and, um, and come back later, but that's fine. So once, once you've done the whole survey, I mean, you can sit down and do the whole thing. If you've got people next to you, you know, um, who, know who know the answers, it would probably take you, I don't know, you could probably do it in an hour, uh, I'd say. Um, uh, but that, you know, you'd have to answers at your fingertips. So once you've run through the survey, um, it gives you, gives you results straight away. Where are you? Now, recently, I, I, I sat down with Land Savile Church, which is um, not far away um, from where I am, and, and we did it for that church. And they're, they're quite active environmentally already. And um, uh, I, was, I was quite surprised. So here, here are categories. You can see, like, worship and teaching. Well, it turned out that they did so well that they, they'd have attained a gold award. You know, so they were very good on that. The building would have attained a bronze, um, community engagement with silver, lifestyle was bronze, but they just they just fallen down. They couldn't actually have a bronze award because they weren't quite managing their land sufficiently um, but well well to, to gain one. But by doing the doing the survey, you could just see well look, if I did one or two things that the survey recommends, I'd get there. And and it turned out all they had to do actually was to make some provision for wildlife within the, within the churchyard. Um, you know, something like a bat box or a bird box or a bug hotel, you know, that, that sort of thing. Because, uh, and that would get them over the line. So I think, I hope they've done that already. I'll have to chase them up um, and find out. But that, this is where the tool is really useful because it just, it gives you an idea. Okay, actually we're doing really well on, in one area. Um, you know, we, we do, our lifestyle's great. We use fair trade, people lift say to church, whatever. but. But in another, we could do something. So maybe your building isn't quite up to scratch and you just have to install some LED light bulbs and that would, that would get you there, you know. So at this sort of level, going for bronze, often it's quite small things you can do um, to get you over, over, the, over the line. But it's just great to have that sort of guidance as to what things to work on. So that's how the Eco Church scheme works. Uh, and well, one thing to make, one thing I found helpful in St. David's diocese, and, is um, to have what we, we just called an eco church companion, someone to help walk alongside. So, if you've got some eco churches around you already, um, maybe someone from one of those would be willing to come across to to um, to somebody just embarking on the scheme and just sit down and, and lend a hand. Uh, eco church isn't complicated. You might find that a church doesn't need that, but it, it doesn't hurt if someone makes an appointment to say, "Look, I'm going to pop by." on such and such a date and we'll go for the survey together it makes it happen doesn't it you know someone's going to do that for you and i just found that was that was useful and i was the eco church companion in a way for dan stable church i just showed you and it really helped them to get going and to and, and uh, 
to get un underway. And um, I find it helpful because it refreshed my memory as well of, of the survey questions and so on. So um, part of Eco Church, uh, an important part is the management of church land. Yeah, most you know, rural churches have got some land to their name around the church, sometimes also at a distance in, in, a, in a sort of cemetery uh, elsewhere. And I sort of picked this one up um, because although in terms of energy um, and carbon emissions, probably stuff you do around the building and transport is going to get you closer to the zero, uh, zero carbon target as a church in Wales. But there's something about the land that's really important for two reasons. One is because we can get a little stuck, I think, on um, seeing Caring for creation in, in a sort of technical way, you know, as, as a, just a numbers and the carbon emissions and so on, which is a bit dry and a bit, it sort of turns you off. And so when we engage with the land, it kind of brings us closer to that wider call to care for all of God's creation. You know, I just think that's important. But also when we care for the land, we just cross boundaries um, physically because that's the kind of way into church, isn't it? But also in communities because people outside the church use church land and appreciate it and value it in all sorts of ways and it's a, just a great way to engage with um, the community uh, and to, to build bridges uh, in a way so um, and here's a photo of a, a very common way church land looks you know I mean it, it managed uh, for those people who like playing bowls um, pretty devoid of wildlife uh, on the lawn but very common that churchyards are kept in that way neat and tidy because they look cared for um, but there are, of course, as you know, if you want to manage a church, not just for people, but also for wildlife too, the two can, can coexist really well together. And, uh, and you can have a beautiful churchyard um, uh, as well as a, a functional one that people can visit and enjoy and, and visit the, you know, the graves of their relatives too. So, but it takes a bit of work and care you know, to, to do so. Probably, um, here's just a churchyard with a rather beautiful species rich meadow around and churchyards really are one of the few remaining places where the species rich grassland that used to cover most of Britain um, are still to be found because most of those meadows have disappeared as you know as agricultural practices have changed and silage is much more common you know than, than any hay meadow. Um, churches are very important seed banks for these, you know, for biodiversity, if they're managed properly. Now, I think um, you've probably heard of God's Acre, possibly have, but fantastic charity across the UK. Probably if you're going to try to do some work outside on church land, I'd recommend engaging with them. You can do lots of information you can get from them free, but also you can give them a ring and they can, you know, can pop down and give you some guided help, but, you know, that, that'll come at, come at a cost. But God's Acre really helpful uh, charity um this is a, this is just um i'll finish off a couple of pictures of um it's this out one of my churches st jerome's in the village that i live in in, in langham and uh, just to you know kind of reiterate that point of engaging the local community so we managed a little bit of our church not the whole lot but for, for as a hay meadow and um which means you have to kind of um, manage the grass cut it, remove it to so get the fertility down, which, it, which the flowers enjoy. So it's a bit of a task, but actually it's something you can share and do together, invite people to join in, and they're often quite willing to do so. And so we've got some of our children from the Sunday school who are quite happy to go through the doors of the church, but also we've got those who don't do that, but they will, they will come and do stuff outside. You know, they'll come in the church. So it's a great, it does bridge the gap very well, I find. And uh, here, um, uh, in order to get a bronze award, just a few years ago now, actually, um, when I first went through the process, we had to put some provision for animals in, in the church. So we built a bug hotel, you know, which the uh, children were very proud of. Um, and uh, here they are, I've just completed that. And uh, as you can imagine, you know, most of the work wasn't done by them, but the little bits they did, they felt <laughs> extraordinarily proud of. And it was good to have them uh, involved. And they're still there today. Um, this bug hotel is very, very solid. Um, so, you haven't had a lot of time to go into go into details and I've sort of majored on energy and sort of outside but just to kind of pick a couple of themes um, to get you thinking really 
Um, but there are lots of lots of very good resources out there um, that you can draw upon. Um, so, for example, uh, well, Eco Church. If you go on their website, lots of videos and resources there. You know, but I draw your attention to the, the Church of England Environment Program um, because they're, they're, they've, they've, they're really really good seminars and resources there. Um, if you, I'm not, if you check on the website, there's stuff that's forthcoming. But all of their seminars that have been, generally, you can click on a, you know, on, on the link and watch them again. And there's all sorts of stuff about zero carbon, about managing land and nature, about and about engaging with eco church. So I think they're they're really good. Recommend those. And uh, there's a podcast of them. Uh, um, myself and two colleagues from the diocese put out every month called Carbon Crunching Clerics, and um, we kind of take the year, the um, the months, uh, the, the kind of church's calendar and season, and, and, and look at that and see how can we worship God and care for creation through, through often what's existing in the church calendar and, and bring in you know sort of seasonal things as well. So um, we've just recorded one for the, because as we're going to September, you know it's a season of creation. So the, the last one is about the season of creation. So that pod, if you go to St David's Darcy's website. It's on, it's on there, you can find that. But uh, that's that. And then uh, just put my um, email there if people want to contact me afterwards. Happy to you know, have a conversation with you. I'm sure um, that can be shared as well. So I won't go on too long because I guess time is getting on. But uh, there we go. I'll answer questions a bit later uh, in the evening, um, as I'm called to do. Thanks, everyone.